this has the chance to be absolutely bonkers because, you know, I think everyone knows who's going one. Nobody knows who's going two. Nobody knows what's happening at three. The NFL draft is coming and we are getting prepped with the NFL Network's Ian Rappaport. Plus, a legal settlement involving the Larry Nassar case is nearing a billion dollars in payouts. The Texas Rangers did right by their staff. And it costs more to see Caitlin Clark's first WNBA game in Indiana than the Pacers' first playoff game. It's Friday, April 19th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Up next, Ian Rappaport is one of the most connected NFL reporters out there, and we are heading toward the league's biggest offseason moment in the NFL draft. We talked about the biggest narratives heading into this draft and the information flow between reporters, teams, and agents. I asked about Deion Sanders' claim on this show that teams will leak negative stories about players they want to draft, and we talked about the new NFL rules. That conversation is coming up next. Excited to be joined now by NFL Network insider Ian Rappaport. Welcome, Ian. Mets just hit a home run, so forgive me if my eyes are elsewhere but day baseball is the best because i can make my draft calls and also yeah watch right but you anyway, know yes. you, your heart's in the right place there um so on to less <laughs> important topics uh the nfl draft is next week what are the the big narratives for you heading in so we put out our draft announcement earlier and i was kind of retweeting and i was just you know thinking about the draft as a whole and i said something that i think is very very true this has the chance to be absolutely bonkers like drafts are always a little crazy and i think last year was Certainly one of the crazier at the top because we got the big Texans. You know, we got the sort of surprise pick at number two, C.J. Stroud. Then the big trade up at number three, and that kind of set things on fire. This has a chance to be just like that because, you know, I think everyone knows who's going one. Nobody knows who's going two. Nobody knows what's happening at three. No one knows who's trading to four or five or six or how many quarterbacks go in the top 10, maybe five. Like there's, there's a, there's just a lot of things that are unsettled. And that's when, you know, it's going to be really, really fun is when going in, no one knows anything. And then whatever trades are going to happen are going to happen on the clock. Yeah, not you, we were just talking about this internally with FOS folks, how, and this is just like another media property where everything just kind of lines up beautifully for the NFL, where all the chaos happens at, at the event itself, while teams are on the clock, um, as opposed to, you know, everything trickling and shaping itself up, you know, leading up to the event. And as by the time you're there, you kind of know what's going to happen. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's 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 kind of I don't know if it's designed for chaos is chaos rules here. Yeah. And, and chaos always rules. Um, and I think one thing that's happened over the last like three or four years, maybe is, well, I shouldn't say one thing. It's been several things that have sort of converged younger, more uh, sort of risk happy GMs who are okay saying like, you know what, I'm going to make this big trade. And if it doesn't work out, I'm going to be okay. And I'm going to make another trade and finding willing partners and being okay. Talking about trades with each other. The salary cap has gone up immensely. So players with big contracts can now get traded in a way they couldn't before. Like, the Bills can trade Stephon Diggs knowing he's got a $30 million salary cap hit and still be functional and okay, right? All of these things are sort of converging. And then I think for the draft, what that basically means is that you have a lot of younger GMs and some of the older GMs too, but younger GMs who are willing to trade, who have the money to do it in a setting where trades and chaos is now expected and highlighted. And so it leads to just bonkers things um, which is the best. I mean, the draft is the best. It's my favorite thing we do every year by a million. Um, and you just, you know, I do, I feel like as much work on it as anyone leading up and I have no earthly idea what's going to happen. And that's the way it should be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is that, uh, tolerance for risk that you're seeing, you know, as, as an increasing thing, are there structural factors that are leading to that? Or is it more like a cultural thing? Is it more like younger GMs? Is it more like everyone's just aiming for the top? So, you know, no point in in going safe if you can, you know, get maybe an Anthony Richardson who's, you know, high risk, high reward. What's leading to this? A couple of things have happened. Um, The owners are, you know, we've gotten some new owners in the NFL, but I think the, the owners are, probably to me, at least it seems at an all time high of engagement, right? Like every head coach, every GM talks to their owners regularly. So what that means is increased education. As far as like, if I do this move, 
here's what happens. And when owners are on board, these moves are easy. And I think what has happened for a lot of the really good teams is the coach or the GM can sell the owner like, we are going to make this big move. And whether it works or not, and obviously some of these things don't work, here's why we're going to do it and getting everyone on board. And when these places are all on the same page, it leads to more things. It leads to more action, more trades, more big contracts, more bold moves, bold signings. Um, and we've seen so much of it. And then once you have some, you know, there's always been some teams that have been willing to make big moves. Like Eagles always have, Seahawks always have, um, the Jets have certainly done it plenty of times. Texans are now one of those teams that does. I mean, there's there's a lot of teams that make now bold moves. And when you see some of those teams win the Super Bowl or become perennial contenders, um, what you find out is, you know what? Being bold uh, can help you win. And even if it doesn't work out, if the sort of methodology was sound, then it's okay and then you can do more fun things in the future. Like that's what this is, environment has led to. And I will say uh, it's very stressful for me and the other people who do what I do because bonkers things happen all the time. Uh, but it's also what makes it unbelievable. Yeah. And to the NFL league where you'd almost rather win three games in a season than like seven or eight, because if you, I mean, all things being yeah. equal, maybe you'd rather be the seven or eight team, but that three win team, they're going to get a nice, nice draft pick uh, and maybe a nice schedule the next year. And if you're just stuck in the middle, maybe you're stuck and, and it starts, you know, should we go up? Should we go down? Um, uh, so, yeah, it's a league that lends itself maybe to to these big swings and, and taking, you know, a chance as opposed to saying, you know, like, oh, like, you know, maybe in other leagues, you, you know, maybe NBA, NHL. If you're in the middle, you're in the playoffs and you can go from there. Whereas the NFL, um, yeah, you either want to go big or, you know, we, but the, the middle is kind of a tricky spot. Yeah, it's it's the worst place to be. You're right. Because like, and then I think we saw some of that this year, like the Vikings to me are the best example. You know, now the, the money for Kirk Cousins was a lot, right? But I think for the Vikings, it was really like, love Kirk Cousins, respect everything he's done. He's a very good starter. The money's getting to a point where it's not efficient anymore. And can we win a Super Bowl with him? Can we make the playoffs perennially with him? And I think what they've decided was it is time to go younger. Um, it is time to go a little bit cheaper and just find a higher ceiling. And I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I do think that's a little bit what happened is they're like middle is bad. So it is time to reset and try to go big. Um, you know, if the Giants end up trading up for a quarterback, which is certainly possible, I think it'll be the same line of thinking. Um, now, I will say, yes, it's better to go three and 14. Fans will never understand how unbelievably terrible it is. Like, let's say you're a fan of the Commanders and you were happy every time they lost. Literally no one in that building was happy. It's awful. I talked to a team that picks in the top five who won a game and I was like, oh, you know, was it mixed feelings? Like, no, it's amazing. Today is amazing. Like, even against their own well-being, they all want to win every freaking game. Deion Sanders said something interesting on this show recently that I wanted to bounce off you. Uh, he claimed that um, teams will sometimes leak negative stories about a player that they're interested in drafting to either get them to drop down to them, or maybe they get them in the second round when they could have gotten them in the first, so they're cheaper. W wondering what your thoughts on that are. So that that's, to me, that's sort of like a draft myth, I guess you would say. I, that's something that people say. I do this a lot. Like, I will go through my phone and basically call everyone I know. I will talk to many, many decision makers on many, many teams. And... I can prob I'm not saying it has not happened. There's one example specifically where a team, I would say probably got the guys in his thirties by now. So probably 10 years ago, a team told me that a player had a weakness in his shoulder, hoping that I would say it, hoping that it would, you know, get back to, to everyone else. Like, you know, does it matter? I, I personally don't think it matters because teams have all the same 
information. They don't have all the same medical information. A lot of teams share medicals. I don't think it matters, but I would not say it never happens. But, you know, probably less than the amount of fingers I have in one hand has it happened to me where a team leaks negative information. You know, if anything, it's almost like they're protective of that information because they don't want to get back to them that they're killing some player. You know, like, I think that's more of a myth than anything else. And if it was going on, you know, I talked to a lot of people. I think it would come to me. Um, and I just I, I just don't get the sense that, that that's the case. Mostly because, like, everything is so transparent now. Like, if there's character issues on a player, there's been some legal thing or medical, whatever it is, like, everybody knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, I, I bounced that same question off Andrew Brandt just on, on Twitter, um, who's, you know, he's been on both the player side and the team side. His take was, yeah, it doesn't really happen so much with the teams. Agents maybe might be the ones that are trying to feed a, a certain narrative one way or another. How, how do they factor into all this? I talk to a lot of agents, a lot of agents of top players, not top players, a lot of them. And they can be helpful. They can tell you where a player's going and what teams are interested um, many, you know, the really good ones who've been doing this for a long time have a sense of where their player is going before the draft. So, you know, sometimes they will tell you if, if you have, you know, good relationship with them and you really trust them, they will tell you like, Hey, here's the window. Or they'll say like, I remember there was a quarterback who I think a lot of people thought was going to the first round and did not end up going, talked to his agent the day before the draft. And he was literally like, I don't have a spot for him. I'm nervous. And I was like, that's real. And he did not end up going in the first round. It's like agents can be very helpful. It's just important to know that they represent their players. They are acting the best interest of their players. So they will always tell you what's going to happen to their players, usually with the best case scenario, right? So like, I don't think there's a lot of misinformation from agents. I think they are just, they naturally represent their players. Um, you know, will you get sometimes like, well, my guy's better than this guy? Like maybe, but what usually they'll tell you is like, you know, talk to this team or go do your research. You need better. You know, I don't get a lot of lies. I'll get a lot of like, you don't have the right information. Go talk to more teams. I want to bounce a couple of relatively old topics off of you. Um, Just you know, some of the bigger stories from the off season. Uh, Bill Belichick. Why did he not land a job with an NFL team? Yeah, it's frustrating, honestly. Um, it's frustrating. He's the greatest coach of all time. I feel like he should be a, a sitting head coach in the NFL. Um, it's frustrating. You know, I think there were a lot of – talk about myths. There were a lot of myths about Belichick. You know, he wanted mm-hmm. full control. I don't think he ever did. I know he never said that. Um, you know, he's going to come in and change the culture and leave. I don't know about that. You know, I mean – would he coach for 15 years? Probably not. But like my guess would have been just guess at least five, probably more. Yeah. Um, he loves football. This is what he wants to do. And I think mm-hmm. he had it in a way in New England where he could have continued indefinitely had the quarterback situation been better. It's just, it's a big leap, you know? And I think this year, one of the trends in coaching hires was positivity, mm-hmm. collaboration. You know, a lot of the guys who got hired, not, I mean, Belichick is actually a really, really good guy. But he sometimes puts off the affect of yeah. not being that, especially post-game mm-hmm. media, et cetera. Um, so I think teams are like, we want to go younger and we want to be more just happy, collaborative, supportive. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think he'll be a coach next year. I hope he is. I think the NFL is better when Bill Belichick is in it. Uh-huh. The NFL also is a change some rules as they do from time to time. The hip drop tackle is out. There's a new kickoff rule that, you know, is maybe going to bring kickoff returns back. We'll see, I guess. Um, What's the NFL trying to do with all this? You know, nobody consults me when they make rules changes, which is too bad. They really should, but nobody consults me. Um, I hate the hip drop tackle. I don't like plays that are disproportionately hurt people. Like I can watch the Mark Andrews play a hundred times and be like, he is breaking his ankle. Like mm-hmm. it is obvious. Um, and I guess, you know, I understand defensive players are like, what should we do now? And the answer is yeah. don't do that. Don't do plays where you really hurt people badly. Uh, that was an obvious one to me. I didn't like it. I thought they did a good job with it. The kickoff is really fascinating. You know, again, yeah. no one consults me. 
No, in no part of my brain would I have come up with that answer for the kickoff. It is really smart and clever. And kickoffs can be so fun. Just big plays for, yeah. out of nowhere brings the team back into it where they weren't previously. Like kickoff returns are awesome. Um, and some of the most electric players are <laughs> kickoff returners. So I think it's really clever. It's going to look weird, but like everything looks weird. It's like, you know, someone changes their website and all the complaints are like, oh, it looks different. It's like, well, yes, things sometimes <laughs> look different. I think the kickoff is going to be better, and I like that one. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm excited. I was, you know, when they essentially got rid of kickoff returns, I was a little bit bummed. But also, if if this is a big source of concussions, like, okay, maybe we should get rid of those. Um before we let you go, uh, just jump back to the draft for a moment. What are you most excited for um, heading into next week? Um, well, I, there's something I look forward to. This is not anything that fans would care about, but about 10 minutes before the draft, like you put in all the work, all the calls, all the hours, endless research, all of that. And then 10 minutes before the draft, nothing can happen. There's no trades. There's no calls. Hay is in the barn, nothing. And it is so tense and it's so stressful. And I look forward to it every year because it uh. is like the most anticipation. The only thing I could ever possibly compare it to is like, I go to the Kentucky Derby every year and mm -hmm. the five minutes or so before the race and like the horses are kind of walking around, you can feel the buzz and everyone's there and there's nothing to do except just wait and watch. And it's the best. And this is what that's like. Like it is, and you have no idea what's going to happen. And everything everyone told you, it's all meaningless because now it's about to play out. And that, I look forward to that. Um, you know, seeing who goes two, seeing who goes three, who trades up for a quarterback. Oh, that's going to be awesome. Um, but the anticipation right before the draft is just the best. The Justice Department has agreed to pay around $100 million distributed to 100 victims of Larry Nassar, the former U.S. women's gymnastics team doctor who is serving a 60-year sentence after being convicted for numerous incidents of sexual assault, according to the Wall Street Journal. The FBI was found liable for not taking athletes' claims of abuse seriously. The Bureau was very slow to respond to accusations brought to them, and Nassar continued to see patients for 14 months after USA Gymnastics contacted the FBI. With those payments, the total legal payouts related to the Nassar scandal are close to $1 billion. That includes $500 million from Michigan State University and $380 million from USA Gymnastics and the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. These final payments represent the legal conclusion of this scandal, which shook the gymnastics world to its core. Major League Baseball players get bonuses for each round of the playoffs that they win, and last year each member of the Texas Rangers received a bit more than $505,000 for winning the World Series, while the Arizona Diamondbacks, who lost to the Rangers, each got $313,634. That's a substantial paycheck for the younger players, but more like a cherry on top for those on big contracts. But both teams made sure that the same bonus their players received was paid to all of their clubhouse attendants. For them, it's a life-changing sum. One clubhouse worker, Lupe Uribe, told USA Today, I know that no matter what happens to me, my family will be taken care of forever. They won't have to worry about a mortgage ever again. Here's hoping that going forward, every team does what the Rangers and Diamondbacks did, and the behind-the-scenes employees are well-recognized. Caitlin Clark is already a massive draw for the WNBA before she's played her first game in the league, and some teams are looking to max out when she comes to town. The Washington Mystics are moving their June 7th game against the Fever from their regular home, the unimaginatively named Entertainment and Sports Arena, which has a capacity just over 4,000, to Capital One Arena, home of the Wizards and Capitals, which can seat more than 20,000 people. Meanwhile, The Athletic is reporting that she is closing in on a deal with Nike worth over $20 million. As for the Fever, tickets for their home opener against the New York Liberty on May 16th range from $38 to about $1,500 on SeatGeek. That top figure is higher than the eleven twenty nine dollars you would have to pay for the most expensive tickets to the Pacers playoff opener in the same arena. That's it for today. Leave us a rating or review wherever you get your podcasts or share this episode with the NFL fans in your life. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday.